New City Pop County people are watching with you. If, if they can't hear, they've been posting the comments. It sounds too low or whatever. You can just, if they do that, just text me. Okay? If I didn't think you could do it, I'm going to do it. Because I'm trying to get tired. It would fit behind here, the door would open just a little bit, but at least you can.
See what happens. So those are the ones we're supposed to use still? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I can hear your mic. Your mic. 
Like the guitar. I don't have a microphone. Right there, on this video, it said it's not microphone. So something in here is on. Well, you got all this open, I don't video playing in the background of you. Mm-hmm. You don't have a mic on you? Mm-hmm. 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 Is it recording the video, the audio from the mm-hmm. computer? Yeah, it is. That's what you're picking up is this.
saying uh, 420, uh, soul being saved and it's just been a great blessing but there's a great there, there's a spirit I sense in the church tonight that I haven't felt all week I, I feel a spirit of unity in God's house among God's people I really do I feel like God's people Mount Zion uh, friendship wherever you're from Mount Olive I feel like the Lord has done some reviving in his churches this week, don't you? I feel, I, I really, I feel there, there's a sense of something here tonight, Brother Dalton, that I hadn't sensed in a long time, of churches coming together and working together. And listen, you might as well get used to me, amen. If you're going to heaven, I'm going to be there. You might as well like it, all right? You say, you'll be different. I'll be known as I'm known, all right? I ain't going to change a whole lot, Brother Dave. The Lord made me this way. But I'm glad to be saved tonight, and I'm glad uh, that we've got this opportunity to come together as churches and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not here for any other reason tonight but to worship Him. And I've already felt a touch from heaven. I've already sensed something happening here tonight that we may go home and talk about for years to come. And that song that they sing by the Marks, 
in, of the nails in his hands. I'm going to know who Jesus is. There'll be no question about it. All right? But the proof will be in his body. Amen? Danny preached on Sunday night that Thomas wanted to see Jesus for himself. Danny preached and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe till I see the marks. And when he saw Jesus, Jesus said, look here. Reach hither your finger. Behold my hands and my feet. And then he said, put your hand in my side, Thomas. It's me. It's me. And unless, if you think something's going to happen between now and the, and the Lord coming back to get us, you're wrong because the book of Zechariah said that Israel, the book of Zechariah said that the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem would look on him whom they had pierced. Amen. The piercing's still there. The marks are still there. And I'm going to know, Jason, who Jesus is by the proof. Amen. I'm glad tonight. Now, listen, let me just say this to you, and then I'm going to turn it over to the preacher. We've got one thing as a people that we can come together and be united around right now. Okay? And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His blood has made us all one. His blood's made us one. Amen. We're one people. We're one body. We're united tonight around the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that. There's not friendship, Bethlehem, other churches. There's one, and God's united us. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer before one of these preachers comes on. And uh, let's lift this service up that God might move in such a mighty way. And maybe somebody will get saved if there's somebody here that's lost. And maybe the church will get so on fire tonight that we can't help but be revived and tell a lost and dying world about how good God is. Brother Ricky Stone, lead us to the Lord in prayer. God, what a great blessing you poured out on, on us tonight, God. God, I love you tonight. And God, give us something for the service we need.
certainly we count it a privilege to be uh, with you once again. Um, I want to say in the outstart that uh, I appreciate uh, Zion for hosting us this week, uh, for all the meals that you've given us. Um, tonight, especially if, uh, if you see me get wallered down and slowed down a little bit, it's Doug's fault. Uh, Doug's uh, meal on Saturday night has always been a, an epic uh, adventure, I'd say. It takes a lot to, to put on that large of a meal for that uh, large group of people. And uh, I thank him for him and his family for his hard work uh, that he's done. And, and all the ladies and people who've had charge this week over feeding us, um, I had uh, thought I had started losing a little bit of weight, but that's, that's gone off the backside now. We're just, we'll worry about that late next week. Uh, glad I don't have to go to the doctor for another month or two. Uh, but certainly it's, it's been a joy and a privilege. But most of all, I want to thank you for your prayers. Uh, and for the liberty that you've given us uh, to be able to preach this week and to do what needed to be done. And, and I hope I've just maybe been a help to you at some point in time this week and done what God would have us to. If you'll pray with us one more time and, or uh, just support us and pray, with, uh, pray for us, uh, certainly uh, we've probably got more preachers here tonight than we've had all week. Um, I am the least of any of them, most definitely. Uh, it wouldn't hurt my feelings for every one of them to come ahead. Uh, I, I am, as I said, the least of them, uh, but I'm a Gerard, so that makes me one of the loudest one of them. Uh, so uh, it, I, I'm going to try it not be my fault that uh, uh, you might, your bellies might be full, but I'm going to see if I can't keep you awake just a little while. Uh, but you pray for us most of all that Danny will get out of the way. You don't need to hear from him. Amen. You need to hear from God. Amen. Uh, and truly, uh, let's work together to be able to see what God has in store for us tonight. If you want to read with us, we'll be reading out of the book of Hebrews in the third chapter. Uh, we'll read mostly from the third chapter, but I want to continue on a couple of verses down into the fourth chapter as well. So you pray for us that God would have us to do just exactly what he wants us to do tonight. Uh, seemingly, uh, uh, we've, we've kind of flipped. Uh, I don't know, we as preachers sometimes, I think a lot of us, we, we kind of feel like maybe we one night you might preach to the church, and a lot of times, sometimes in early in revival, you, you feel like you're preaching to the church, and then you kind of slide over and start preaching toward the lost and things along that line. Sometimes it's just straight up to the lost, you know. Uh, I don't know about Chris, seemingly his subjects and mine, uh, seemingly we've kind of swapped around a little bit. We kind of started out a little bit uh, to uh, maybe preaching to the lost and then sliding back in and preaching the, uh, toward the church just a little bit to maybe lift them up. Uh, but tonight I want to do my best uh, to try to maybe preach to the lost, but if you get something out of it, then I want you to because I want it to be a help. Uh, you know, people, I, I really believe that uh, we as Christians, uh, we need to, of course, I, I, I love to eat. Uh, it's one of my favorite pastimes. Uh, people might like to play and say baseball's a favorite pastime, but eating's one of mine. Uh, but uh, I, I, I like to, but I also like to feast from the master's table. I feel like we as Christians need to eat from that table ever so often so that we might be able to keep our spiritual being fed and ready to do what God would have us to. And we truly need to keep ourselves ready, especially in this day and time and the age that we're living in. You know what? I, I, I remember a, a lady up at uh, Crescent Hill when we was there saying that um, really we should count ourselves privileged or maybe honored in a sense that God has chosen us to live in this specific time period simply because I, and, and y'all heard it all your life I have mine but I truly believe that we're on the threshold uh, we're nearing uh, Christ's appearance and he has chosen us in this generation to prepare for the coming of God Amen. we need to be ready right. we need to be mindful and we need to especially be up and about our Father's business to do as much as we can to get folks saved 
before that, as the Bible calls it, a great and dreadful day. So let's just uh, join in together. You pray for us now in the third chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, and let's start with the fourth verse. Bear with me. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter and a couple of verses out of the fourth. So starting in the fourth verse, it says, For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always error in their heart and they have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. I believe we've already heard that one time today. Uh, that the, the work was done before the foundation of the world. What about that? You see, uh, some people want to believe that uh, the plan of Christ was well after the Mosaic Law, uh, well after the children of Israel and the carrying away of Babylon. But I want to say this, God had that thing planned out long before the whole thing even started. God knew what it was going to take and God knew that it would take His Son to do it. Amen. Now, the foundation was laid. People came along. Adam and Eve came along. Uh, they sinned in the garden. Uh, time carried on. People uh, began to uh, populate the earth. Uh, sin seemingly just keep coming along with them and got worse and got worse. Here they came uh, and the flood came and cleaned off and, and just completely destroyed every single person, everything on the face of the earth, save those that were safe in the ark. Uh, you remember... Sodom and Gomorrah, how evil it got. And how eat up with sin that uh, the wrath of God was poured out upon it. Uh, and just a few of Lot's family was rescued out of that horrible place that was destroyed by God. Uh, and here we are. Now Moses has uh, come along. He has taken the people and led them triumphantly out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God, uh, crossed over the Red Sea, and was given an opportunity to march proudly and boldly into the promised land of Canaan that God had promised His children. But when the report started coming back in after Moses sent spies in, 
all but all but two came back and they all said the land is too great the people of the of the land are they're they're huge they're too great for us to overcome they overlooked the fact that every single thing they had already been through god had brought them through it uh, they so quickly forgot how the mighty hand of God brought them out of Egypt. They so quickly forgot every single one of them laid eyes, physically laid eyes on an entire sea being spread back before them, right in front of them, so they might be able to march along on dry ground and be able to escape the hand of Pharaoh, to be able to escape the people that were trying to bring them right back into bondage. They witnessed that for themselves. And here they were on the other side of that, just right on the, uh, the threshold of stepping into the promised land and they said no it's just too much it's just too much we'll never be able to go in and enter in we're just not going to be able to do it so God made them wonder for 40 years in the wilderness of sin out there wandering around just, just really just roaming around in a circle just going around in a circle is all they were and God made all those with unbelief fall by the wayside and die in that wilderness and never got the opportunity to march boldly into the promised land because of their unbelief. Now, every single one of them, every single one of them wasn't. You remember there were several that come out of, that, several of them that came out of, of Egypt that was ready to march in. They were ready to go in. And God allowed them to live and see the promised land. Why is that? Because of their faith. Because of their belief that God was able. Now, we have Christ who has came, as the writer put it, has came uh, with his own house. I like that, don't you? Who's... We are. I'm, in, I'm a part of that household. How about you? I'm a part of the house of God. You say, how do you know that? Because I know I've been saved. I know I've, I've been touched uh, by the Holy Spirit of God. I've been born again, sanctified, saved and sealed until the day of redemption that I might be able to enter into that rest, that promised land that God has promised us that we might be able to have peace eternally with Him. Why is that? Because you're a preacher? Nope. Because you might be able to play the piano? Nope. Well, because you might be able to sing a little song here and there? Nope. It's simply because I accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. He done the work. He done all of it. It's because of Him, praise God, that we might be able to have that rest. And by you not believing that, by you not accepting that, you're the exact same way as the children of Israel that didn't believe God was able to bring them into the promised land. You say, no, that's a different thing. Had I saw all those great wondrous works, had I saw the Red Sea part, had I saw how God was able to bring uh, little old Israel, whom, let me say this, they were shepherds. They were not warriors. They were just old shepherd people, old farmers. Uh, some of them maybe had some handicrafts here and there, but they wasn't a warrior in the bunch. And the first battle that they come across uh, by all means, every military person that would look at that and size up the armies that they were supposed to come across, they should have been wiped out. Amen. Why weren't they? Because God brought them through it. Because God done the battle for them. Because God had won the war for them. It wasn't because they were good fighters. It wasn't because uh, some of them just kind of 
haphazardly figured it out along the way. It was because God was in control of it. And let me say this. God's in control of my life. Is he yours? God's in every battle that I win. That's for sure. Because I couldn't do it. It was in by the power of God that I'm able to overcome and only by him. He deserves all the credit, honor, and glory. I'm going to tell you what I've done one time. I may have told this. I don't know. Some of you probably heard it. I want to tell you this. I announced my call to preach. And, uh, I don't know. It had been a couple of years maybe. And a boy old Satan had me just beat up. I mean, I was beat down. I got a little spot down in the woods there that I go to try to pray at. And I went down there just beat down. Just, I mean, just weary from, from, from Satan and, and what he had thrown on me and how he how he'd just caused me to doubt things and do things. And I was just beaten and worn down. And I went down, tried to get a little bit of relief in the prayer ground. And I went down there and got to praying. And I got a hold of God. I mean, I got a hold of God down there. Wasn't nobody but me and the squirrels down there. I believe I got some of them chirping just a little bit down there. And, uh, boy, I just, I just felt really refreshed, felt strengthened, uh, felt empowered. Uh, and I thought, boy, I'm ready now. I'm ready to go. Let's go. And I rose up from that prayer ground, and I marched out of there. And on the way out, it probably ain't but about 100 yards from the time I get up from where I was at and get up onto the clearing to get back toward the house, uh, probably about 100 hundred yards if that and boy that whole way I was thinking you just come on Satan I got you buddy I got you and remember now the words that come out of my mouth was I've got you I kept saying that you come on I've got you before I got to the top of the hill he had me beat down again why is that because I said I have got you it wasn't me the only reason that I can claim victory it's through Christ Jesus. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the three in one. It is because of Him. It is because of them. And it is because they have the power. You try to face Satan by yourself, you will lose every time. Do not underestimate our foe. Do not underestimate your opponent. Uh, that's one thing I tried my best uh, to instill the students that I had uh, when they would come up and, and begin competing in, in different places and stuff like that. I would constantly look at them and just completely tell them, never underestimate your opponent. Because the moment you do, you're going to drop your guard. You drop your guard, you're going to get your head knocked off. Uh, so I'm going to tell you this, never underestimate the power of Satan. I know God allows him to give all the power that he has. It's allowed by God, uh, but buddy, he's a whole lot stronger than we are by ourselves. Amen. You better be ready. You better be ready. And you better take the whole armor of God, like the book of Ephesians lays out for you, every part of it, and you take the Holy Spirit of God with you. To do battle. But I want to talk to those who don't have him. I want to talk to those as the writer was trying his best to talk to the Hebrew children here. Uh, that he was trying his best to tell them. He was trying to explain them from a way and a point of view that they could understand. They could. Uh, a lot of them knew what God had done for them, how he brought the children of Israel out with a mighty hand, uh, and how Moses, this great and wonderful leader that they had, uh, was able to do the things he had. And it wasn't Moses' fault that they put so much stock in him. Uh, it was their own fault from not realizing where Moses' strength came from. Uh, you see, they thought maybe on the edge of uh, the promised land, maybe they felt like, well, Moses is just not going to be be able to get us through that. It wasn't Moses that did it. No way. It was the power of God that done them like that. And if you go to heaven, 
It'll be by God's plan through his son and the shed blood that he gave for you on the cross of Calvary for the atonement of your sins and mine that you might be able to have life and have it more abundantly by accepting the Lord Savior Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That is the only way. Christ said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. It is through and by him that we're going to make it home. Now, you think about this. Think about it as how the writer is trying to put it to those people that the wrath of God was poured out upon the children of Israel because they denied the fact and had the, didn't have the faith in God that he had the ability to give them a land that he had already promised them. They felt like that he didn't have the power and was not capable of giving them that land. Because of their unbelief, the wrath of God was poured out upon them in the wilderness and they were not allowed to go into the promised land but died right there in the wilderness of sin. Now, if God was provoked to anger, as he put it, in the day of provocation, that there that they were when they turned and didn't believe that God had the ability to do it, how much more wrath might he have on today's generation that you believe or don't believe that he has the ability to save your eternal soul and bring you in the land of promise, which is heaven, which is created not by hands, but by the power of God. How much more wrath do you think? Because now he, he loved his children. He loved Moses. And they turned their back on Moses and God right there. And it angered God because of that, and he didn't allow them to go in. Now, one that is greater than Moses has come, being Jesus Christ, God's own son, and you deny the faith in Christ, God's only son, to keep you out of heaven. You believe that he don't have the ability to save and sanctify you. You believe that he doesn't have the grace and mercy and glory to be able to seal and sanctify you. You, because of your disbelief, would not enter in. How much more wrath do you feel like it's going to be poured out on you? God help you. God help you. The writer wrote two different times. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Two different times in that short little chapter, just 19 verses, he said, today, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart. I beg of you, if God is touching you through the Holy Spirit of God and convicting you of the sins that you've done, you say, well, I haven't done much, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not that old. And I've, 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 I've not really done anything of that, you know. I ain't never killed nobody, you know. I ain't, I ain't never stole from nobody, uh, you know. I, I, I've never, I've never committed most of the top ten, you know. You might say, I've never done that. No, but if the Spirit of God's convicting you, you've done wrong somewhere. You remember, it was only one little bite out of a forbidden fruit that cursed us all to hell. That was a sin in God's eyes because he said not to do it. And that one little bitty sin is all it took to curse the entire 
human race. Just one. Have you done that? Just maybe one? And you feel the convicting power of God kind of making you feel bad because of that? Stirring your heart just a little bit? You know, conviction. That's the call of God. The convicting power of God is the Holy Spirit wooing you to come to an altar of repentance. For the door is open and ready for you to be able to step into it. All you've got to do is just release, let go, repent of your sins, ask Christ into your heart, accept Him, and believe and confess. And it's that simple. You say, how in the world is something that important so simple? I've done said this one time this week. Christ done the hard part. All you've got left to do is believe. It was because of their unbelief that they were not allowed to enter in. That's all. They, they didn't believe God had the ability to do it. And the children of Israel, the majority of them, did not enter into the promised land just because of their unbelief. That's all. That's all it was. Just that simple thing of unbelief. Are you going to make the same mistake by your unbelief in the crucifixion, the blood atonement, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Are you going to let the unbelief of that keep you from entering in to the promised rest that he has for you? You see, there's only one sin that is unforgivable. Did you know that? You name any sin you want to. You name murder. You made uh, pedophiles. You name adulterers. You, uh, you name scoffers. You name any of them that you want to name. Any single one of them. But there's only one that you cannot be forgiven for. And that is simply unbelief. Blaspheming against the Holy Ghost is not believing that Christ, not accepting when Christ calls you, when the Holy Spirit of God calls you and convicts you, turning that away, that's the only thing that will keep you out of heaven. The only thing. You see people marching around sometimes, toting signs up, you're going to hell for this, you're going to hell for that. Boy, that makes me so mad. You ask my wife. We'd be going down the road, somebody having a big old sign up, hanging up somewhere, you're going to hell for this, you're going to hell for that. Boy, I just get stirred up. I go preaching going down the road. I, I, she's ready to jump out of the car sometimes, I can guarantee you. Uh, she didn't get hurt doing that, but I guarantee you she'd figure out how to tuck and roll real quick but, uh, every once in a while because it just really burns me uh, because I want to look at him. I want to lock a car down and say, hey, I want to tell you this. You've given all these folk, uh, people damnation uh, for doing this and doing that. It's simply because you don't believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and accepted it in your heart. That's the only thing that's going to keep you out of heaven. Bless God, it's all this other stuff. I got sealed and sanctified because I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe He came. I believe He lived a perfect life for 33 some odd years. I believe He bled and shed His blood and died on a cruel rugged cross that I might be able to have life and accept in that blood that was shed for me on cross and Calvary. I want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. You've heard this said. I know you have. I've preached it several times before. I truly believe I truly believe that the reason it took Christ so long to die on that cross and what kept Him up there in his mind's eye, he was looking down through the ages of time and he was seeing all those folks that was going to accept him through the pages of time. Hey, hey, I want to ask you folks that are saved, I want to ask you, how does it make you feel knowing that Christ 
saw your, I, I believe he saw each one of our faces. I truly do. I truly do. I believe, I believe he saw your face. If you accepted Jesus Christ, I believe he literally saw your face down through the ages of time. And he said, that's why I come. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm dying. Because you're worth it. I'll stay right here. He could have called a legion of angels to come and wrap the whole hillside out and carry him off that cross. But he chose to be able to stay there so that I might be able to accept Him and be saved one day, bless God. <laughs> hey, I want to tell you, that ought to make a shout of victory, bless God. Go through Him and by Him, we are able. <laughs> hey, Lord. I feel that chicken now. <laughs> Do you know him? Amen. Do you know him? Yeah. Better yet, do you know him as your personal Savior? Because you believe it. Because you believe it. Do you believe that Christ has the ability to save you? Do you believe he came and lived that perfect life? Do you believe that he died on a cruel, rugged cross? Do you believe the blood that he shed was an atonement for your sins and mine? Do you believe that they pulled him off that cross after he had gave up the ghost? They pulled him off that cross and put him in a grave, in a borrowed tomb. He it was call it borrowed because he wasn't going to need it for long. He gave it right back. Uh, and just placed him in that tomb. And on the third day, rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave to be the first fruits of the resurrection. One of these days, bless God, I'm going to be planted possibly if God tarries his coming. And I'm planted down somewhere. Bless God, when the trumpet of God rises and it shouts in that eastern sky, I'm going to come up out of there with a brand new glorified body that I might be able to stand in the presence of God and live with Him forevermore. All because, all because I believed. All because I believed. These gals up here in this choir, them little ones on that back row, I believe I know what their favorite song was. I don't know if they saved or not, but I believe whether they are or whether they don't, their favorite song is, I Remember the Day. I heard them ring the rafters on that one, didn't you? Bless God, bless their heart. I love it. I love to hear children sing. I love to hear children. Boy, <laughs> don't you know that God just smiles real big when he hears little children sing a praises unto him? You won't get me stirred up and broken, boy. You get children to start up there and start praising God. Oh, and the innocence that they have and all they believe. You see, we must come to Him as a little child. We must come to Him believing that He has the ability to do what He said He was going to do. And when little children get up and start singing the praises of God, it just warms my heart because I truly believe that God's sitting back up there just smiling and just glory, just really, really being able to feel the love coming out of them children, being able to sing. Do you know him? Do you believe in him? Have you accepted him? Can you enter into that rest? Or are you going to deny him? Are you going to harden your heart? Today being the day of salvation, are you going to harden your heart and turn away from Him and Him wanting to give you the most precious thing that you could possibly ever get? Are you going to turn Him away? Are you going to go away in disbelief because you don't think He has the ability to do it? He is able. We've already heard news from a good country just right up the road. How God's still in the saving business. He's still saving today. He's still calling today. 
Today is the day of salvation. While you stand on your feet and these boys come out here and get a song, brethren, come on out here. Today, today, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. What would you think if today was the only opportunity you have? I'm not saying it ain't, but I'm not saying it is either. Because we're not, none of us promised tomorrow. It don't matter how old. It don't matter how young. It don't matter what your status is in this life. It does not matter. If God is convicting you, and today is your day, would you harden not your heart? Would you come and believe while he sang?
Give me a 